Welcome back to our special, The Power of Pride, Who We Are. The HIV and AIDS crisis isn't in the rearview mirror just yet for Atlanta. Doctors like Wendy Armstrong say the city is the epicenter of the epidemic. Armstrong and her team at Grady's Ponce de Leon Center have seen a 33% increase in the number of HIV patients they've treated in just the last decade. She says preventative medicine like pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP has become critical in combating the virus. It's a single pill once a day that when taken um, in someone who's not HIV infected can prevent in almost all situations getting HIV infection. We need to treat those who, are, who have HIV and we need to give PrEP to others. We do those two things, we end the epidemic. But successfully treating those with HIV goes beyond medicine, as Trace and Bragg shows us. When you get that HIV positive diagnosis, a lot of times, a lot of your, your will to live, you feel like you lose something because of all of the stigmatizing behaviors in the community. Larry Scott Walker knows the feeling too well. In 2007, I found that, that I was a person living with HIV, and the first thing that occurred to me was that I was the only one that I, you know, now I had to, you know, live with this, 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 this scarlet letter. We shut down the feelings our dreams are over when a person find out some bad news and that was me at one point. Larry and his now business partner, Dwayne Bridges Jr., eventually found they were not alone at all. They started Thrive Support Services in 2014 as a way to reach other black men in Atlanta living with HIV. I don't think that enough people know that, you know, black gay men and trans women of color are still dying at alarming rates. 37,000 people in Atlanta live with HIV. More than 70% are people of color. It's a startling statistic that only compounds the stigma people with HIV already face. A lot of things contribute to the high numbers. You know, one, lack of access to care, um, experiences of implicit bias, be it homophobia, racism. The team at Thrive is combating the stigma with compassion by helping 3,000 members across the country get access to food, housing, and medical care. I'm going to connect you to this clinic. I may go with you to this clinic as well, and I'm going to follow up to find out when is your next appointment. Building lasting friendships with people who understand simply by being there for each other. The support has meant a lot to know that I can get on the phone and call someone and say, hey, today is not my day. And for them to let me know that I was there too. And this is how I made it through. At Thrive, we often say, like, you know, we don't want to just live with HIV, we want to thrive with HIV. When you're thriving with the thing, that thing no longer has the power to pull you into a negative space. When it comes to compassionate care, the numbers don't lie. Dr. Wendy Armstrong says programs that offer additional services like transportation assistance, nutrition guidance, and mental health counseling are more successful in the long run. You have this diagnosis, it's scary. Instead of um, going home and feeling like you're gonna die, we actually wanna get you into care. Um, someone diagnosed with HIV today, if they get into care and stay in care, has a, the same lifespan, essentially, as someone who's not infected with HIV. The most important thing is that when somebody who's terrified walks into the door of a clinic, that they feel arms wrapped around them. Tracen, thank you. Well, that compassionate care is imperative, not just in treating people with HIV. A judgment-free environment is a key ingredient to overall wellness. Daniel Wilkerson experienced that firsthand. No one likes going to the doctor, but for LGBTQ people, the doctor can be especially stressful. Tonight, we take a trip to my physician's office as a gay man of color, I want to walk you through the importance of being able to speak candidly and openly with your doctor. Right away, you know something is different. From the second they walk into practice and they fill out an intake form, um, they are choosing what pronouns they want to be called by. So for example, if you're a trans man or a trans woman. On this day, I'm here for a physical. I see my physician's assistant, Jeremiah Robinson. With someone uh, who's in the LGBTQ community, I'm asking specific questions, sexual risk factors. Uh, I'm assessing uh, what immunizations you may need that you're, uh, someone else who is straight may not need. The physicians who work here are among the few openly gay doctors in Metro Atlanta. LGBT is considered actually a minority. Um, in the U.S. One of the big reasons the LGBT community doesn't really go to the doctors is because there's a lot of stigma. There's almost a fear of bringing up sexual orientation and talking about sex with your doctor. That can be a very uncomfortable thing, not only for the patient, but for the doctors too. So it creates almost this wall. 
studies show 50% of gay men are not out to their doctors, and that's just as important for your physician as it is for you. But if you have a doctor who is well-versed in sexual history, LGBT healthcare, it kind of breaks down those barriers and makes it a lot easier to talk about um, being gay and how that affects your health. Dr. T.C. Elliott, also a physician here, says, you not only have to be out to your doctor, you also have to be open and willing to discuss anything. Talking about your sexual practices in clinic is much more in depth here. Uh, so for example, gonorrhea and chlamydia can live in the throat, it can live in the anus, it can live in the penis. Um, you wouldn't know to test those sites unless you knew what kind of sex a patient was having. So if you're top, you're primarily the insertive partner. Uh, if you're born at the bottom, you're more of the receptive partner. Some patients are versatile and they prefer to both top and bottom. Um, and there's kind of everything in between. Some patients don't like penetration. Others only prefer oral sex. Um, some are only into physical touch. And then I wanted to know about the issue of mental health among LGBTQ. We spend a considerable amount of time up front talking about your mental health. How is your sleep? Are you engaging with your friends and family? Um, how do you feel on a daily basis? How do you feel about your, your appearance, your weight? All those things kind of play a role in their identity and how they feel mental health wise. These doctors say by building trust, they are seeing results and that is what will save lives. It doesn't feel so much like you're going to your doctor. It kind of feels like you're going to a friend who just knows you well and takes care of you. It really does break down the barriers and it makes it so much easier to talk to your doctor or about anything that comes up. Widespread outbreaks of hepatitis A are occurring across the U.S. and many of these outbreaks are affecting gay and bisexual men. Tracy. Daniel, thank you. The medical challenges extend to LGBTQ women as well. Research indicates that lesbians are more likely to have risk factors for breast cancer and other types of gynecological cancers, but are less likely to get the screening exams. When you talk about sports, you can't beat this one when it comes to what the LGBTQ needs to see, how they're scoring points that others aren't. That's coming up. If I say my name is Diane, call me Diane, regardless of what these other documents say. Documents, pieces of paper that turn everyday life into a struggle, even exposure to danger, the harsh reality of daily life for so many.